Thank you very much for the super kind words, Dr. Callaghan. I'm very pleased to be here today to talk to you all about medications. Um, I didn't put it on the slide, but I have no disclosures. And um, I'm hoping at the outset that um, my talk could be as interesting and informative as Dr. Deutsch's, but I don't know if I'll quite get there. I'll do my best. Um, but in any case, um, before I talk about the new medications and the up and coming medications, I'd like to briefly run over the currently available medicines for Parkinson's. And this is going to be pretty quick because I'm going to run out of time otherwise. But uh, currently available, of course, is levodopa, which is used to treat the motor symptoms of Parkinson's and some of the non motor symptoms, but motor symptoms being primarily tremor, the muscle stiffness, and the slow movements of bradykinesia. Um, Levodopa is still the most potent drug we have to treat the motor symptoms of Parkinson's. It works because it's converted uh, into, uh, directly into uh, levodopa in, in the brain itself. Um, typically, carbidopa is added to levodopa in the commercially available preparations uh, in order to reduce some of the side effects, the nausea and dizziness uh, from low pressure, blood pressure. Um, so it's available in several forms. Um, carbidopa, levodopa, the combination pill, the old brand name was Cinemet. Uh, it's also available in a controlled release form. It's involved, um, it's available in an orally dissolvable tablet called Parcopa. And then carbidopa and levodopa are also packaged together with intacapone in a medicine called Stilevo. In addition, carbidopa is available on its own as a medication called low dosin. Uh, the next category of drugs we have right now are called dopamine agonists. These are drugs that bind to dopamine receptors in the brain and mimic the action of dopamine, but they are not dopamine. Um, again, they're used to treat the motor symptoms of Parkinson's, the tremor, the stiffness, and the slow movements. And they can be used alone or with levodopa. These include ropinirole and uh, premipexil. The brand names are Requip and Mirapex, and these come in extended release forms as well. Retigotine is now available for the last two years. It is a patch uh, marketed under the brand name Nupro. Apomorphine, or Apican, is a subcutaneous injection uh, that is used as a rescue medication uh, injected under the skin uh, for patients with um, a very advanced Parkinson's disease who have abrupt off states. And then finally, bromocryptine uh, is rarely used these days for the treatment of Parkinson's, but it's available. The next category are the monamine oxidase B inhibitors. Again, uh, these work to inhibit the breakdown of dopamine, allowing the available dopamine in the brain to hang around for longer and have more effect. Um, it's for the treatment of the motor symptoms in Parkinson's and can be used alone or with levodopa. These include selegiline and risagiline. Risagiline uh, is marketed under the brand name Azelect. Catechol O methyl transferase inhibitors or COMPT inhibitors also inhibit the breakdown of dopamine, this time outside the brain. Um, these medicines are only used in, as an adjunct to levodopa. They're not used alone. Um, they help prolong the action or uh, the life of levodopa in the body and to reduce the uh, off time and wearing off. Um, these include intacapone or COMPTAN, um, and then a combination of carbidopa, levodopa, and intacapone, which is a Stilevo. Tolcopone is another that's available on the market, uh, but there is a black box warning for potential liver toxicity, so it's not used very often. Non-dopaminergic drugs, um, the previous medications all um, influence the dopamine system, so there are a couple of drugs that work on other neurochemical systems in the brain. So acting on the acetylcholine neurotransmitter system are trihexyphenidyl and benztropine. These are used primarily for tremor control, and their use is limited in the, the elderly and the cognitively impaired because of some of the side effects. Um, amantadine uh, is a drug with many mechanisms of action um, and is used primarily for tremor control and, um, more, more importantly, for levodopa-induced uh, dyskinesias. And dyskinesias, again, are those uh, sort of uh, uh, semi-involuntary or involuntary restless movements that are a consequence of uh, advanced Parkinson's and a long-term use of levodopa. Um, I briefly touched on some drugs we use commonly for non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So for dementia, 
Um, cholinesterase inhibitors are used. Uh, these include ribostigmine, which is Exelon, um, Dinepazil, which is the Aricept, and Glenantamine, which is Razodyne. Another category of dementia medications are the NMDA receptor antagonist, and Mamantine or Nemenda is one of these. Okay. So those are what is available or have been available um, for some time past. Right now on the market, there is a brand new drug that has just come out. Uh, I don't think it's quite commercially available yet, but it's been approved by the FDA. Uh, this is droxydopa. This is a medicine that's used to treat a condition called neurogenic orthostatic hypotension that Dr. Deutsch mentioned uh, a bit about. Uh, this is a drop in blood pressure upon st when the patient stands up uh, due to failure of the autonomic nervous system to regulate blood pressure um, as it's supposed to in response to changes in posture. So um, this leads to the feelings of lightheadedness, dizziness, um, it leads to fatigue, it can lead to fainting and falls, and it can be a significant cause of reduced quality of life in uh, patients with Parkinson's. It's also a side effect of levodopa and the dopaminergic drugs. Um, so currently, um, the medicines we have available to treat these are mitodrine, fluticortisone, and sometimes peridostigmine. Droxydopa, which is going to be marketed under the brand name Northera, is a synthetic compound. It's um, broken down into norepinephrine in the body. Norepinephrine then acts to increase the blood pressure by causing the blood vessels to constrict. It was approved by the FDA in February of this year. Um, for use in severe neurogenic orthostatic hypotension. Um, and the study showed evidence for benefit um, and improvement in the blood pressure numbers as well as symptoms and quality of life from orthostatic hypotension. Uh, but the benefit was not proven beyond two weeks. Uh, it does appear to be safe and well tolerated, and it does carry a black box warning um, for something called supine hypertension which is when your blood pressure gets too high when you're lying down flat. Um, patients who will be on this medicine will be uh, re required to sleep at the head of the bed somewhat elevated to prevent um, the blood pressure being elevated uh, too much while they're asleep at night. Uh, so that's, that's coming out in the near future. Um, I, there are many, 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 many drugs in various stages of development, um, so I didn't have time to talk about all of them. but. Um, those I did, I broke down into two categories. There are drugs that are used to treat the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So symptomatic drugs are drugs that, uh, when given, the symptoms return when the medication is taken away or, or wears off, um, versus a neuroprotective drug, um, which is a medication or treatment that actually slows down the loss of nerve cells in the brain. So I wanted to talk about symptomatic drugs first. Um, these drugs treat, again, either the motor or the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease, depending on the drug. I broke these down into two categories as well. Um, one is uh, there are drugs that, um, old drugs that have been around for quite some time, but um, we have found some new ways to give them. Um, and then there are new drugs that target, again, other neurochemical pathways in the brain, as right now most of the drugs we have focus on dopamine. So this is a... Uh, a ripe field for research and development at the moment. Um, but levodopa is, is, is quite an old drug. It's been around since the 60s, I believe. Um, uh, it remains the most potent drug, as I said, for treatment of the symptoms, the motor symptoms of Parkinson's. Um, but with progression of the, the disease, the brain stops, um, starts responding diff differently to levodopa. It doesn't stop responding ever, but it doesn't respond quite as efficiently or well to levodopa. And so prolonged use of levodopa, coupled with uh, a patient with advanced disease or disease progression, leads to motor fluctuations. These are the, this is wearing off. Um, delayed time to effect for the medicine to kick in when you take it. Dose failures, which is when you take a dose of medication and you get no on state, no effect from that particular drug. And then dyskinesias, again, those excessive movements. Um, in advanced Parkinson's disease, levodopa, does eventually have to be taken more often and at higher doses, and then wearing off and dyskinesias do occur at some point, uh, most of the time, uh, with prolonged use of levodopa. So currently, um, the strategies that we, that, that we have to avoid these wearing off or motor fluctuations with levodopa are um, 
using extended release forms of carbidopa levodopa. Um, this is a somewhat problematic extended release pill. It doesn't work all that well. Um, it tends to take a longer time for the medication to kick in and take effect as compared to the immediate release form. Also, the blood levels don't get as high because it's, it's not absorbed as uh, consistently as the immediate release form of levodopa. Um, and it's useful mainly at nighttime. It does not delay the development of eventual motor fluctuations. Um, MAO inhibitors and COMPT inhibitors also, again, inhibit the breakdown of dopamine so that more is available for longer for use. Um, so there are now two new formulations of levodopa uh, coming up and coming. Uh, aimed at reducing motor fluctuations. Uh, one is a combination pill containing both extended release and immediate release uh, levodopa, and the other is a levodopa in a gel that's actually uh, infused into the intestine. I'm going to talk about the latter first. It's called duodopa. Uh, this is, again, a levodopa gel. Um, how it works uh, is the patient has basically a, something like a feeding tube inserted into the stomach that opens through the abdominal wall. And uh, I make this thing work. Yeah. So the, the feeding tube is in the, the, the gut here and comes out to the abdominal wall. And there's a tube leading it fr from it to a little battery powered device. Um, and the device contains the medication that has to be um, uploaded into the device, essentially. Um, but the, the device um, continuously infuses small doses of levodopa into the intestine. Um, and the patient you see is wearing this little fanny pack to uh, keep the device uh, on, on him at all times. Um, and so this was approved for use in Europe in 20, uh, 2004, 10 years ago. And it's currently being considered for approval in the U.S. and probably will get approval soon. Um, a recent trial um, uh, comparing uh, the, the gel versus immediate release uh, levodopa pills found that, that there was two hours less off time uh, every day uh, with the gel. Uh, so it, there, is, there is some benefit, and uh, there's certainly a population that this will be very, very helpful for. Um, some considerations um, in this uh, method of treatment are the cost, of the financial cost of the treatment itself, the surgery, the device itself and the medication have a cost associated with it. Um, the management of the device, um, the physician will, of course, uh, the, set the uh, rate of infusion, and the caregiver or the patient will have to uh, put the medication into the device. Um, the risk of the procedure, it's a surgical procedure, so any risks that go along with surgery uh, go along with the device, although it is a relatively minor surgical procedure. And then there are other potential risks. Um, some patients have developed neuropathy, uh, which is uh, damage to the nerves, usually in the feet. Um, this uh, is thought to possibly be due to a decreased ability to reduce the vitamin B12 uh, from the gut uh, uh, related to this treatment. Um, but that being said, it's a valid consideration for patients who um, have advanced Parkinson's who have motor fluctuations. <clears throat> and the best candidates are likely going to be those, those types of patients um, um, who are really not uh, good candidates for deep brain stimulation. Um, Ritari is the immediate and extended release combination pill, levodopa combination pill, and it literally just is the same thing that's in Cinemet and Cinemet CR but put together in one pill. It's intended to smooth out fluctuations in blood levels of levodopa and to reduce wearing off. Um, it's been submitted for FDA approval again this year, and it's awaiting approval. And I think the only thing really holding it up at the moment is a problem with the manufacturing facility, not the, the drug itself. So that should be coming out relatively soon. Okay, so those two medications that I just talked about are levodopa, and they're targeting the dopamine system. Um, what Dr. Deutsch mentioned is that a lot of the research now is being focused on uh, these other neurochemical systems involved in Parkinson's disease. Uh, these include serotonin, glutamate, acetylcholine, norepinephrine, adenosine, histamine, GABA, um, and uh, this is a ripe field for research. I'm not expecting you to be able to read this slide, but uh, this I got from a paper that was published a little over a year ago, and um, 
This is a list of all the drugs that were being investigated at that time for neurochemical systems in the treatment of Parkinson's disease other than dopamine systems. So you can see there's a lot on there. Um, since this was published, some of these medicines have fallen off the list. They're no longer in trials, and others have been added on. But it, research is, um, is, is ongoing all the time. I obviously can't talk about all of them, so I picked out a few. So um, for the adenosine system, adenosine is a neurotransmitter, a neurochemical um, uh, in the brain. Um, it acts on certain, it acts at certain receptors or proteins in the brain. Um, there's a certain type of adenosine receptor called A2A that's located primarily in the basal ganglia. And uh, it's been found that blocking these receptors with, with certain drugs uh, can help the brain initiate movement. And movement initiation is the problem in Parkinson's disease. Um, it's what leads to the slow movements and the stiffness, et cetera. So several A2A blocking drugs are being studied right now. Um, these are uh, being studied with the uh, uh, intention of helping to improve motor symptoms in Parkinson's, the tremor, the stiffness, the slowness, and to reduce dyskinesias associated with levodopa use. Um, there is some question of whether some of these uh, agents may be useful in neuroprotection as well. Estradephylene is the first A2A receptor uh, blocking drug that was approved anywhere in the world, and the only one. Um, it was approved in Japan last year for motor fluctuations or wearing off in patients with Parkinson's who are taking levodopa. So it's not approved in Japan to be taken on its own, only with levodopa to help uh, reduce wearing off. Um, and studies uh, have been encouraging with, uh, with that particular drug. And it, also proved to be self safe and well tolerated. Um, Tozadinid is another um, A2A antagonist drug that's being studied currently, and there are many, many, many more uh, on the list that I didn't have time to mention. Um, for the glutamate system, another neurotransmitter, um, there are a couple of different uh, uh, angles uh, that are being investigated. There is something called a metabotropic glutamate receptor. Uh, which is, again, a protein that glutamate acts on in the brain. Um, um, one uh, of the drugs that has been investigated recently and received some press was mavagluran, um, and it was being investigated for uses um, against dyskinesias. Um, the initial trial uh, was positive, but then uh, two further trials have recently been halted for lack of efficacy. However, uh, other similar agents are being investigated, and there's a question of whether drugs acting against this particular receptor uh, may be useful for neuroprotection uh, and or for dyskinesias. Interestingly, memantine, the Menda, which is the medication I mentioned uh, being studied or being used for dementia in patients with Parkinson's and in dementia in general, um, uh, is being studied for its use against dyskinesias as well. It also acts uh, on the glutamate system. And so we'll see what, what pans out there. For the acetylcholine recept, uh, neurotransmitter system, um, there's a couple of more familiar drugs. Dinepazil and rivastigmine, Aricept and Exelon, uh, work on the acetylcholine system. They're what are called cholinesterase inhibitors, and they're used for dementia currently and approved for dementia. Uh, they're now being studied in regards to postural instability. That's the poor balance in Parkinson's disease. Right now, there is no medication that treats postural instability, uh, nor does deep brain stimulator stim stimulation reliable, uh, reliably improve postural instability. So if we could find a medication that helps with that, that would be fantastic. Uh, we'll see what happens. Nicotine, uh, Dr. Deutsch mentioned smoking. Nicotine acts at acetylcholine receptors and is being studied for both symptomatic and neuroprotective benefits in Parkinson's. And then an another category of medications called nicotinicus receptor agonists, um, which work on acetylcholine systems, um, are being studied for dyskinesias. Okay. All right, we come to the serotonin system. Um, this one is uh, another promising drug, Pimavanserin. Um, so for some background in Parkinson's disease, psychosis is uh, not uncommon in late stages of the disease. And right now we treat it with what are called atypical antipsychotics. Uh, two in particular that we like to use are clozapine and quetiapine, or clozaril and seroquel. Um, 
so-called typical psychotic drugs like haloperidol can actually worsen the motor symptoms of Parkinson's, and so they aren't used. Um, but the atypicals have some issues as well. Clozapine carries a, a, a risk of um, a potentially fatal reaction, which is a failure of the bone marrow to produce a certain kind of white blood cell. So while it's a great medication, um, it requires a lot of monitoring and blood counts. Um, both clozapine and quetiapine carry the risk or carry a black box warning for increased risk of cardiovascular disease and diabetes. Um, but I say all that um, because the mechanism of action of antipsychotics in general is thought to be mainly on the dopamine system, but there is some um, evidence that the atypicals also uh, act on the serotonin pathways in the brain. And that's where Pima Vanserin comes in. It works at a certain type of serotonin receptor, um, the 2A receptor, and it's currently in phase three clinical trials um, for Parkinson's-related psychosis. So far, the results indicate that it's, it's quite efficacious against psychosis, uh, which is the hallucinations and, and delusions, et cetera, um, with no worsening of motor symptoms of Parkinson's and no safety issues identified, including cardiovascular disease risk. So very promising drug, um, may be coming out uh, soon. So some drugs tar target more than one um, neurotransmitter system. So partoprenox is one. It has actions on the serotonin system. It's also a partial dopamine agonist. Um, and uh, the clinical trials are encouraging uh, for use of partoprenox in uh, motor symptoms in Parkinson's. We'll see. Sifenamide. Uh, is an MAOB inhibitor. It also works on the dopamine and glutamate sy uh, sy systems. Um, so two clinical trials recently revealed a significant improvement in the motor symptoms of Parkinson's versus placebo and didn't show any significant side effects. Zanisamide uh, is already available in the U.S. It's marketed as Zonegrin. Um, it's used for seizure control and a few other things. Um, but it has a similar mechani mechanism of action to sofenamide, and it's actually been approved in Japan as an adjunct to levodopa for the treatment of Parkinson's motor symptoms. All right, so I'm going to switch gears a bit. All those medications that I just mentioned, I focused mainly on their role in treating the symptoms of Parkinson's disease, and now we come to uh, the world of neuroprotection. Um, so again, a symptomatic drug is one that treats the symptoms, but the symptoms come right back if you stop the drug. A neuroprotective drug or treatment actually slows down the loss of nerve cells in the brain and changes the course of the disease itself. Um, of the currently available drugs, only one, which is risagiline, has some data, um, inconclusive data, showing that it might slow down the course of Parkinson's, uh, but no medication has an FDA indication right now uh, for slowing down the progression of Parkinson's. Um, studies of levodopa, selegiline, vitamin E, pramipexol, and coenzyme Q10 have proved negative for evidence of neuroprotection. Okay. The, um, the, the, the drugs I'm going to mention are being investigated for their neuro, potential neuroprotective benefit, but none of them, again, have been approved or proven uh, uh, to confer that benefit yet. Okay. So. Um, uh, the first category is the antioxidant drugs. Uh, there are several in this category. Zanisamide, Zonegrin, the medicine I just mentioned, uh, does seem to have an antioxidant effect as well. And it's being studied in patients with early Parkinson's. Interestingly, uh, epidemiological studies have shown that people with high levels of uric acid, whether that's due to um, uh, uh, how much they take in their diet or because they have gout, may have less risk of developing Parkinson's disease or may progress more slowly if they already have Parkinson's disease. Um, and so innocent is a, an agent that has uh, been shown in trials to raise uric acid levels. Now, um, at this point, increased uric acid levels have not yet been proven to be neuroprotective, but it's a, a question that, um, that, that bears further investigation. Um, one caveat of Raising the uric acid levels is that uh, increased uric acid does lead to increased risk of cardiovascular disease and gout, so I don't know how that's going to pan out. Um, tropic factors are chemicals or, or compounds in the brain. Um, loss of these particular compounds 
in Parkinson's disease does seem to contribute to cell death. And so there are ongoing studies with one of them called the glial-derived neurotrophic factor. Anti-inflammatory drugs. So inflammation does appear to play a role in the production of the disease state in Parkinson's. But whether inflammation is the cause of the disease or the effect is, is a bit unclear. So non anti-inflammatory drugs have lo been looked at NSAIDs. Um, one study showed that uh, regular NSAID use lowered the risk of developing Parkinson's disease. A follow-up study by the same group showed that only ibuprofen and not naproxen or any of the other NSAIDs uh, had this neuroprotective effect. And then yet other studies have not found any significant link between NSAID use and development of Parkinson's. So at this point, uh, the jury is still out, and I can't make any um, official recommendation as to whether you sh people should be taking NSAIDs daily uh, solely for the purpose of preventing Parkinson's, uh, but um, uh, we may find out differently eventually. Uh, at this point, I just can't recommend it routinely. Um, statin drugs, in addition to, to, and these include drugs like Lipitor or Torvastatin, um, in addition to lowering cholesterol, uh, they do have anti-inflammatory effects as well. Um, and again, epidemiology studies have indicated that taking statins might be associated with a re reduced risk of developing Parkinson's. Um, on the other hand, other studies have suggested that low LDL cholesterol levels, which is what you would expect uh, from taking statin drugs, are associated with an increased risk of Parkinson's. So again, no official recommendation to take statins uh, for this indication. Pioglitazone, or, um, which is marketed as Actos, is an oral diabetes medication being studied for neuroprotection. Uh, another category of medications are the calcium channel blockers. Um, Isratapine is a calcium channel blocker that has been shown to protect nerve cells um, uh, in the substantia nigra of lab animals with, uh, who were poisoned with a toxin called MPTP. MPTP, when given to humans or animals, induces a very severe Parkinson's-like state. Um, and, and so, again, on animal studies, uh, giving this medication prior to giving the MPTP toxin appears to protect them from developing Parkinson's. So there have been preliminary studies uh, of the safety and tolerability of this medication in humans, but we've not had uh, trial results um, from trials evaluating uh, whether it actually uh, uh, modifies the disease or prevents progression of the disease or prevents onset of the disease in the first place. So that's, that's up and coming. Alpha-synuclein, Dr. Deutsch mentioned, uh, is a protein uh, that accumulates abnormally uh, in Parkinson's disease and is involved in the nerve damage. Um, so there are some vac vaccine-based therapy trials underway, and these are very early trials, uh, but the idea is to give the patient uh, a vaccine that causes them to make antibodies against alpha-synuclein. We'll see how that turns out. Um, so in conclusion, there are many, many drugs uh, that are currently being studied, and many of them look very promising. Um, the drugs that are under investigation include new ways of delivering old drugs and drugs that target new neurochemical systems, and the, the latter is uh, very exciting, I think. Um, the new drugs uh, are being developed for both symptomatic treatment and neuroprotective treatment. And the neuroprotective angle, I think, is particularly exciting since someday we'll hopefully be able to identify the disease early enough and halt or slow it down enough to prevent development of severe symptoms in the first place. That's all I have.